Well, Israel is a Jewish state, but it's also home to a mixed population. That includes about 20% ethnic Arabs, many of whom identify as Palestinians. And they often face discrimination. With tensions in the region once again flaring, one group of activists in Israel is trying to promote solidarity across ethnic lines. DW's Aya Ibrahim reports tonight from Haifa. A sight to behold. This room contains right now Palestinians and Jews who actually, in the darkest, most polarizing, most difficult moment in the history of the two peoples right now, is choosing to like actually work together. They want to send a message they feel cannot be repeated enough. Millions of Palestinians will remain here and millions of Jewish people will remain here, and that's a fact. This meeting at a mosque in Haifa is organized by Standing Together, a grassroots peace movement made up of Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel. Activists tell me such togetherness has been rare since the October 7th Hamas attacks, and that often demonstrations of solidarity in either direction are met with rejection. We have friends, we have neighbors, we have peers, we have colleagues who are Jewish who got deeply impacted by this. And, and we, we were devastated um, by the attack. Uh, but even that was not something that was fully accepted by a lot of the Jewish public. Oh, you're hurting for us now, but so you can't say you can't identify as Palestinian. We do suffer from um, calls for violence, from being called being a traitor, from incitement against us Jewish people that are working towards peace, that are working to build solidarity um, among Jews and Palestinians. <laughs> the fact that we are even unable to fully experience and grief our people um, is, uh, is like the it's like the, the epitome of our psychosis and our like experience as Palestinians in Israel. Like I'm literally unable to fully grieve my people. Well also like like you're like on a mission to convince people you're human. Like <laughs> um. people here believe deepening divisions in Israeli society make it all the more important to meet and to show empathy with one another. So they put that empathy, quite literally, center stage. In defiance of local right-wing groups, which tried to get the event canceled, it's happening under tight security. It's more than just talk, though. Volunteers visit places where Muslims and Jews work together, like this hospital near Haifa. They handed out thank you cards to staff, written in Arabic and Hebrew. Tamara Asadi is a Palestinian Israeli teacher who works at a predominantly Jewish school. It is important for me to be a role model for my students, for my country, and everyone around me. The visit is happening one month after the October 7th terror attack. It's so important. To remark, to remark the fact that we are together in the staff here and many other places. We are doing very, very naturally, together, togetherness, naturally togetherness. What about Jewish people like yourself? Back at the assembly, I ask Alan Lee Green if he feels their movement speaks for the majority in Israeli society. No. But do all the society, the majority of society, have the interest of the direction we want to go? I think the answer is yes. After the speeches, attendees break up into small groups. They brainstorm more practical ways they might spread their message and to convince more of their fellow Israelis to see each other the way they do. Yeah, an inspiring story there. My first guest tonight is Omar Bartov. He's a professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University and the author of numerous books on war, genocide, and anti-Semitism. He has written on how the memory of the Holocaust informs contemporary Israeli politics. 
In an opinion piece for the New York Times last week entitled, What I Believe as a Historian of Genocide, Mr. Bartov wrote that we know from history that it is crucial to warn of the potential for genocide before it occurs rather than belatedly condemn it after it has taken place. I think we still have that time. Mr. Bartov joins me tonight from Cambridge, Massachusetts in the U.S. It's good to have you with us, Mr. Bartov. Um, you obviously advocate a proactive approach, stop genocide before it starts. Do you see the genesis of genocide in Gaza right now? Uh, yes, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I think that we are very close to um, a, a humanitarian catastrophe. We may be seeing ethnic cleansing as we speak, and that combined with the massive disproportionate uh, killing of civilians may become genocide. You also write that the urge to label all atrocious events as genocide tends to obfuscate reality rather than explain it. So th this urge, is that what we are seeing in these mass protests here in Europe and on university campuses in the United States, a, a rush to judge or label something before the crime has been committed? Yes, that's true. That's the other problem with the, with the term genocide. You know, this term was uh, uh, coined in the, in the mid-40s and then became part of a UN resolution in 1948. And it's a very specific crime. And um, on the one hand, it is important to, as you cited me writing, it's important to warn about the potential of genocide before it happens, because after it happens, it's obviously too late. But at the same time, there's a tendency, because this is considered to be the crime of crimes, the worst crime one can imagine, uh, to label anything that is atrocious, that is terrible, that we object to uh, as genocide. And I think that tends to obfuscate things rather than to clarify them. I, I understand that the, the legal or the academic definition of genocide, I understand that those are important, but um, one could say or ask, does it matter? I mean, the legal definitions, they mean little when the images of human suffering on a tremendous scale tell us that seeing is believing. What do you say to that? I think it does matter, you know, I mean, in war, um, many wars, uh, civilians uh, are killed and there's a great amount of suffering. If you think, for instance, uh, during, the, um, during World War II, uh, the massive bombing of Germany in which uh, hundreds of thousands of civilian, uh, German civilians were killed, um, that was a war against Nazi Germany. Uh, Nazi Germany was carrying out a genocide. The United States and Britain, uh, they were conducting strategic bombing, which might have been defined subsequently, was not, but could have been as war crimes, were not engaged in genocide. So when you show images as such, um, and images of suffering people, you need to contextualize them to know what, how to distinguish between one event and another. It's also important simply because we need to know if we are sliding toward that event, toward genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. or not. And showing those images on their own is not sufficient to make that determination. You know, being able to contextualize anything, it requires um, patience, time, and also a knowledge of history. Do you think in our social media world that we live in right now, um, the, a news uh, um, clock that is on 24-7. Do we have those uh, qualities today? Well, no, obviously not. I mean, what we are seeing, you know, still going back to the war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and now the war in Gaza, um, you, you find that people... Um, have short memories, they haven't mm. studied history, and they are dependent a great deal on social media, which not only gives them only, only tiny little segments of information, but often 
keeps them in a bubble of the kind of information that they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that unfortunately doesn't help us know how to act in any given situation. I'm sure you're aware that um, Germany has pledged full support for Israel. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz he repeated that pledge today. Uh, take a listen to what he said. Israel has every right to defend itself against Hamas and to attack those who are active as Hamas fighters in Gaza. It's unacceptable that Hamas should again have the opportunity to re-establish itself, gather weapons and attack Israel. And that's why we are clear on this issue and stand by Israel's side. Mr. Bartov, when you hear those words, you know, consider that and consider the people that I've spoken with this week. I spoke yesterday with the author Nathan Thrall. He and the German-American author Deborah Feldman, they both put forth the observation that Germany's commitment to Israel's survival and security leaves no room for any criticism of Israel's government and its policies. In fact, in Germany, often criticism of the Israeli state is tantamount to anti-Semitism. What are your thoughts about that? Look, I mean, I, I grew up in Israel. Uh, I grew up su surrounded by Holocaust survivors. I became a German historian. I saw how Germany shifted uh, in the 1980s from um, generally denying any individual responsibility or even collective responsibility for the Holocaust to creating this memorial culture, which is very important. So um, from that perspective, and also as an Israeli, I can say, I agree with what the chancellor says as far as uh, Israel right, in fact, duty to defend itself and its citizens. That is not the question. And I think it's uh, very nice that the chancellor says that. But Germany is a very powerful country, a, a big player on the European scene. And defending yourself from atrocity, responding to atrocity doesn't mean that you should do it yourself. And here, I think Germany could play an important role, first of all, in pointing out that Israel is, is engaging now in what probably looks like uh, war crimes. Um, so that's, that's the, to me, a really important point. It's true that there is now a culture in Germany where it is very difficult to criticize Israel without being accused of anti-Semitism. I've mm -hmm. encountered that myself in Germany, in the United States. I think that's nonsense, of course. I mean, you should be able to criticize a country's policies without uh, doubting its right to exist, which, of course, Israel has like any other country. But, Mr. Bartov, do you really think that it's realistic for a, a German chancellor or a German government to go public with, with that statement that we support Israel, but we think what the government's doing right now um, could constitute a war crime? Do you think that Germany would really ever, ever dare to say that? I think it will. I mean, I think there's actually a growing shift in public opinion in Germany, which is not yet reflected in its political, in many ways also intellectual elites. But I think we're seeing that shift in Germany. We're seeing that shift in the United States. A younger generation is coming to the fore and they're much more critical of Israel. I, I actually worry that um, this will create a sort of backlash against mm -hmm. Israel, which I would not like to see. I, I would like to see um, um, realistic criticism of Israeli policies. And at the same time, I would like that to influence Israel to change its policies so that it would not be subjected to this right now just criticism. Do you think um, Germany's approach to this rise in anti-Semitism is the right approach? We've, got, we've seen some pro-Palestinian demonstrations, for example. They have been banned due to fears of anti-Jewish and pro-Islamist strains being given a public platform. Do you think that's the right approach? No, I think it's excessive. And, and there's also a tendency in Germany, not only in Germany, to, to associate um, uh, demonstrations against Israeli policies with the Arab or Muslim uh, elements in society, which, are, which actually ties in with all kind of prejudices in, in German society as in other European societies. There is a, a, a neo-Nazi 
a, a powerful right-wing neo-Nazi movement in Germany right now, and they're about as anti-Semitic as anybody can be. Mm. So in some ways, this focus on that part of society reflects prejudices in German society, which are uh, camouflaged by a, a um, sort of support for Israel. Uh, so no, I, I don't think it's the right approach. Of course, Germany and all other countries should uh, respond to anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism is a vile um, sentiment, uh, but not all criticism is anti-Semitic. On social media, we see lots of people talking about the, just the sheer number of people who seem to be moved by what is happening in Gaza and in Israel. And they pose the question, why were there no mass demonstrations when Bashar al-Assad's regime was killing countless civilians during the civil war there? Why were there no protests or why are there no protests against the Iranian regime and its treatment of women? With that in mind, do you think that it's possible that there is too much focus or even a fetishization of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, possibly even, you know, how it pertains to genocide? Look, there is. I mean, it's a it's a complicated uh, history, right? I mean, Israel was created right after the Holocaust, so there is uh, in Europe, in the United States, a a particular attitude toward Israel, both a sensibility to its safety and um, sort of sensibility to what it does when it does something wrong. Uh, but Israel also uh, has presented itself always as the only democracy in the Middle East. And so if it wants to be part, and it was moving toward becoming part really of Europe, uh, it wants to be part of that universe, it has to be measured by different standards than the the, the tyrannical regime of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad or of the Iranian regime. We don't expect much of those regimes, but we do from Israel because it presents itself as such, and it should. I think it's, it's the right thing, but then you have to be also willing to be subjected to a different set of standards and criteria as to the way you behave. Mr. Omar Botov, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. Very enlightening discussion. Thank you. We hope you come back. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you very much. Good evening.